Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Atiwa, game by Uwe Rosenberg and published by Lookout Games. Let's get to the game! In Atiwa, players are families of fruit farmers in the Atiwa district of Ghana, trying to expand their family's population and capabilities while working within the local ecosystem. Over seven rounds of play, players will take actions to expand and build houses, bring in wild or domesticated animals, plant trees and fruit, work with the fruit bats and ultimately expand their population of families, all the while keeping them fed. The player who earns the most points over seven rounds will win the game. To set up, each player takes a player board and fills up its rows with wild animals, trees, fruit, families and goats. Family tiles should be placed with the untrained side up, that is the side not showing a bat icon. Each player chooses a colour and takes its three workers and the four help cards showing that colour on the back. This includes the knight card, which is used in play, and three others containing game information. Lay out the main board, clicking in the appropriate extension for two, three, or four players. Shuffle the six round action tiles and place them at random on slots two through seven on the round tracker. The remaining square cards come in two types, brown locations and green terrains. Shuffle the terrains into a face down pile and deal one face up above each of these action slots. Separate the locations by type and place each face up into its matching slot. Each black spot on the icon represents one house on the card. Each player takes a village and places it between these two black hashes in what will be the third slot on the player's first row of the tableau. Then take a family token and place it untrained side into the lower right house on the card. Choose a first player who takes this token. And then based on your player count and starting position in clockwise order, take the matching resource from your board and place it on the matching icon on your starting village. Keep supplies of fruit bats and gold nearby for later use. And shuffle up all of the pollution tiles in the cloth bag. You're now ready to play. Atua is played in seven rounds, which is tracked on this track here. Each round is broken into two phases, the work phase and the maintenance phase. In the work phase, players will take it in turns to send workers out onto the action spaces on the board to resolve the actions, which mostly involves gaining or buying resources. Each player will take a total of three actions per work phase. Then in the maintenance phase, players will run their ecosystems and feed their families. The key to the game is not so much in understanding how you get and use your resources, but rather on how you manage these pieces on your board and in your tableau. So that's what we'll talk about first. There are two types of cards in the game, terrains and locations, and each card gives you eight sub-squares where you'll be able to place resources. Terrains represent what you find when you go exploring around your village. They're cheap, they're not worth very many points, but they give you space to grow. Locations represent places where your families can grow, and they all include houses. They're expensive because you have to build the houses. And although these generally are worth quite a lot of points, they're not worth that many more points than the resources you spent on them. When you gain either type of card, place it orthogonally adjacent to at least one other card that you already have in your tableau. You have a maximum of four slots horizontally for your tableau, of which your starting village is the third, and you're free to build down as well as across, even if a row is not complete. Cards once placed cannot be moved. There are nature terrain cards, indicated by this icon, and non-nature terrains, which lack it. Then there are seven different resources in the game. On your player board, you'll find wild animals, trees, fruit, families, and goats. And in the general supply, you'll find gold and fruit bats. 
When a player gains a resource from their own player board, they take it from the leftmost slot on the appropriate row, and when a player spends one, it's returned to the rightmost open slot. Players may never have more of these resources than are available on their player board, and once a row is completely empty, no more may be gained. Resources still on the board are not owned by the player and cannot be spent. Gold and fruit bats, on the other hand, are gained from and spent to the general supply, and there is no limit to the number of each that a player may have. When a player gains gold, it is simply added to the player's supply, nearby to their player board. It's the only non-ecological resource in the game, representing human wealth and currency, so it's simply gained to and spent from your supply. All other resource types need to be stored somewhere in your tableau. Wild animals must be placed into a space showing a wild animal icon. Goats must be placed into a space showing a goat icon. Trees must be placed into a space showing a tree icon. Fruit may be placed either onto a space showing a fruit icon, or onto an existing tree which does not already have fruit. A family must be placed onto a house space showing the family icon, and when placed, it's placed on its untrained side. Later in the game, if you train a family, flip it over to the trained side which shows a fruit bat icon. A fruit bat must be placed onto a space showing a fruit bat icon, which can include a trained family. With the exception of fruit on trees or fruit bats on families, you can only have one token per square. If you ever spend a token which has another token on top of it, then you also lose the token on top, even if you have somewhere else to put it. So here, for example, spending this tree would force this fruit also to be lost. Many cards come with one or more blank squares, and a blank square can accommodate any token other than a family token which is already on that card. This includes a token on another token. So this empty space here could accommodate a wild animal, a goat, or a fruit bat. Each of these three could accommodate a fruit or a tree, but could not take a goat until another goat had been placed on the card on one of these squares. If you take an action which lets you gain a token and you have no legal place to put it, then you don't gain the token. And once you've chosen the location to place a token down, you're not then allowed to move it later. You can spend it from your tableau, but you can't freely move the tokens. These basic placement rules will cover you in 99% of scenarios. There's a handful of cards and actions which behave a little bit differently, which I'll cover later in the video. For now, let's go back and have a look at the actions you can take in the work phase. In the work phase, starting from the first player and going clockwise around the table, players will take turns until each player has taken three. On a turn, take one of your workers, place it onto an empty action space showing this icon, and then resolve the effect or effects on that space. If there are multiple effects, resolve them in the order of your choice. The top row of actions is all about the terrains. Take the action to take the matching terrain card and the shown resource. In the case of this resource, you would gain a tree and a fruit which must be placed on that tree. If you take an action from the leftmost slot, you gain the top terrain card at random. Actions at the bottom of the board are about gaining new location cards. Spend the gold from your supply and the trees from your tableau to take the corresponding card. There are two slots on each, each round, the second being slightly more expensive than the first. Anytime you take any one of these eight actions, take the first player marker from whoever has it. This may change hands multiple times in the same round, and whoever ends up with it at the end of the round will be the next round's first player. These five slots in the center of the board are basic ways of gaining resources or families. In some cases, you'll need to spend gold for the privilege. Here, for example, spending a gold to gain two goats. On the right-hand side are actions which let you spend gold to gain new untrained families, or spend gold to train families you have. There'll be more of these available at higher player counts. 
For these seven slots, where you placed these tiles during setup, you'll gain the benefit which is shown both on the tile and on the printed part of the board. If you choose the action in the current round slot, then you just get what's printed. These actions will change as the game goes on. In the specific cases of the round 1 and 6 actions, you both gain and train a family, and from a timing standpoint, you train it before you place it on the board, therefore placing it this side up. Finally, these actions on the right hand side of the board can be very efficient ways of either gaining gold or training families if you prepare for it. On this action space, you gain one gold for each nature terrain card which you have in your tableau. And then if you have four terrain cards in your tableau, nature or otherwise, you get to train one family. This second one is the same, but without the added bonus. The second row is the reverse. Here you would train one family for each nature terrain card in your tableau, and gain one gold if you have at least four terrains. And here you would just train the families. Again, there are more of these icons in a higher player count, and this split arrow here, present only on the four player side of the board, means that the same player is not allowed to occupy both of those action slots. At the end of each of your three turns in the work phase, you may take a fruit bat action if you qualify. This is a way of utilising your fruit bats to pollinate new trees. You qualify to do this if you have at least three fruit bats in your tableau, and you have at least one fruit in your tableau, and you have at least one tree in your supply, and you have at least one space to put a tree in your tableau. If you meet all conditions and you choose to take the action, then move three fruit bats from your tableau to your night card, spend a fruit from your tableau, and gain a new tree. You can only do this once per turn, but if you're efficient, you may be able to do it three times per round. You have not lost these fruit bats. They will fly back to your tableau during the maintenance phase of each round. And that is what we'll talk about now. The maintenance phase is resolved in seven steps in this specific order. First is income, and this is where all of the families in your tableau will go out in search for gold. For each of your trained families, simply gain one gold. They know where the gold is, and how to dig it up without causing pollution. For each untrained family, you must draw one token from the pollution bag. Reveal the tokens, and this will show you how much gold you've mined. Each token has about a 50-50 chance of striking gold, with some very rare tokens giving you two. Now flip the tokens back over, and add them to your tableau, blocking out spaces. From left to right, top to bottom, find the first card whose top middle square has no pollution, and then place the token there. If there's anything on that square, then it's immediately destroyed, and returned to its supply. Once all top middle squares are full, you'll go to the top right square, and so on. Left to right, top to bottom, on each card. Second, you'll get income from wild animals, trees, and fruit in that order. The rightmost open slot on the wild animal track will tell you how many trees you gain. The rightmost open slot on the tree track will tell you how much fruit you gain. And the rightmost open slot on the fruit track tells you how many fruit bats you gain. Third is the fruit bats step. Any fruit bats on your night card return to your tableau. If, as a result of actions which have happened since, you no longer have room for all of your fruit bats, then any excess are discarded. Next, you must feed your family. The number in the rightmost slot of the family track tells you how much food you need, and the number in the rightmost goat slot tells you how much food you produce from milking the goats. For any excess, you'll need to spend food from your tableau. In this case, we'd be looking for a total of five food. Spending a goat is worth three food, and note that you do get its milk before you turn it into food. You can spend a wild animal for two food. You can eat a fruit for one food. 
you can spend a gold to buy one food, and you can spend a fruit bat for one food, but only up to a maximum of one fruit bat per untrained family. Trained families understand the value of fruit bats in the ecosystem, and so they won't eat them. In the rare case that you don't have enough to completely feed your family, you will lose two points per missing food. You cannot take this option voluntarily. If you have a way of spending the necessary food, then you must do it. You're not obliged to take the most efficient way of spending food, but you're not allowed to spend excess tokens. For example, I need five food, and I could choose to spend both of my goats, which is worth a total of six food. But then I couldn't spend an additional fruit or fruit bat on top of that to go up to seven, because that would be an excess token. This all feeds into the game's wider rules, which prevent you from moving or otherwise discarding tokens from your tableau once you place them, unless you are legitimately spending them. Step five is breeding. Check the icons above the current round on the board, which can also be seen in the breeding section of your help card. For each of these three resources, or one resource in the final round, if you have at least this many in your tableau, then you gain one more. This player meets all three requirements of at least three families, at least six fruit bats, and at least two wild animals, so gains one more of each. Sixth is workers, where all players retrieve their workers from the board. And seventh is preparation. Any leftover terrain tiles are discarded, and new terrain tiles are drawn. And the next round marker slides one step to the left. Before we go through to final scoring, we'll have a look at a few of the other specific cards and rules which might come up. Normally, you won't find houses on terrain cards. You have to build the house yourself. But occasionally you will, and usually these will be worth negative points. Every so often, you'll also come across an uninhabitable house, which is a house showing this no family icon. These have only one function, and it relates to this bat into house action on the round tiles. When you take this action, ignore the normal placement rule for bats, and place a bat into every empty house and every empty uninhabitable house on your tableau. Be warned that this action is the only way you can put the bats there. If these bats fly away to the night card, they cannot be put back in an empty house when they come back in the maintenance phase. They would have to go onto a different valid fruit bat slot. If you place a family into a house which has a fruit bat, then the fruit bat goes away. Unless you place that family with this specific action combination. Remember, this allows you to place the family on its trained side, and the trained family can share a house with a fruit bat. Finally, these three cards give you some more flexible trees. These three trees in the Diker Forest could accommodate either a fruit or a wild animal. Think of it as a wild bird rather than a pig up a tree. While trees in the middle column of the hedge banks, or anywhere in the Baobab Forest, can accommodate either a fruit or a fruit bat. The game ends after seven rounds, and players will count up their final scores. Each gold in your supply is worth one point. Each card in your tableau is worth the positive or negative points printed in its top left corner. Each track on your player board scores its highest uncovered number, so here 1, 3, 1, 19, and 3. Each of your trained families, whether it has a fruit bat on it or not, scores one point. Score one point for each of your fruit bats after the first 10. That is, if you have 10 fruit bats, you would score zero. 11 would score one, 20 would score 10. Finally, if you were ever unable to feed your families, deduct the points that you lost for that. The player with the highest score wins, and if tied, whoever has the fewest pollution breaks the tie. If still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Atiwa. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you find value from this video or find it useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do that. And hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey.
Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.